I want you to think for a minute about、um, a boss you've worked with who was mean to you. A boss you worked with who was mean to you, or if you haven't ever had a job, just think about a time when someone was mean to you, and they kept on being mean. What was going wrong there? Probably what was going on, right, was that they got the relationship wrong. Your boss, instead of treating you like a boss should treat their employers, instead your boss started treating you like they were some dictator of some country, and like you were their slave, right? Or maybe it was your football coach, and your football coach stopped treating you like you are a human being made in the image of God, and instead started treating you like you were a piece of rubbish. And started shouting at you. This is a common problem in life, right? I get the relationship wrong with people all the time. Yeah, with my children, I get the relationship wrong when I act like an army sergeant instead of like a dad. Right, you lot, get in here now. You're late. Hurry up. Come on. What's going on? Sort it out. Fix up. Instead of acting like a, a loving dad, sometimes I treat my wife. She's not here right now. I, I treat my wife like I'm the CEO of a big company. You know, <laughs> and, and like bringing her into my office. Her, we're, we're not achieving our targets right now.、You、need to do something about this, or you're fired, right? Getting the relationship wrong. I wonder how many problems we have in life where we get the relationship wrong. I mean, think about when you've had problems with your brothers or your sisters. Sometimes it's because your brothers or sisters aren't treating you like a brother or sister, but suddenly they're treating you like their lifelong enemy. That they have sworn to kill and destroy. We have so many problems. I know you've all had people get the relationship wrong with you, and I bet we've all got the relationship wrong with other people. Now, let me ask you this: What is the most important relationship in the whole world? The relationship between you and your Creator, right? That's got to be the most important relationship. The relationship between yourself and your Creator. Your Creator has created you for a purpose. You got to get that relationship right, yeah. So, if many problems in life come from us getting the relationship with people wrong, imagine how many problems in life come from us getting the relationship with God wrong. So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at how we get the relationship with our Creator wrong and how to get it right. And we're going to do that by looking in the Bible at Exodus chapter twenty. But first, let me just pray, Lord God, as we Read your word in the Bible. I pray that you pour your Spirit upon us and give us understanding, so that we can understand how to get the relationship right with you, Lord God. Amen. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter twenty. Now, if you remember, as we've been going through the Bible, we started off with what story? Genesis, Genesis and what story? Adam and Eve. Adam and you got Adam and Eve. God made them, put them in the Garden of Eden. They rebelled against God. They got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, yeah. And then the human race was just getting more and more and more wicked. And then God said, "Right, that's it. I'm going to send a what? A flood. I'm going to send a flood to destroy them all." But He said He would save who? Noah. Noah. Noah and his family. So Noah and his family get on board the ark. They're saved from the flood. Later, they come off the ark onto dry land. And then Noah has children. They have children. They have children, and you end up with a guy called Abraham. And God says to Abraham, "I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and I'm going to put you in a promised land, which is the land of Canaan." But Abraham's descendants end up living in Egypt, and at first they're cool with the Egyptians. They're having a good life in Egypt, but then a new Pharaoh comes along. And this Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites, and he makes them slaves. The people cry out to God because they're in slavery, and God raises up a man called Moses. Moses. And Moses comes and delivers the Israelites. He brings them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and they come to a place called the Red Sea. And the waters part, and Moses leads the Israelites through the seabed, right through dry land. And at this point, the Egyptian soldiers are chasing after them, and the the Israelites go through the sea, and the Egyptians are like, "Rah! Look, the waters come up on both sides. Let's follow them." And they go through, and then God brings the waters back, and the Egyptian army is destroyed, and the Israelites are safe. 
And then the Israelites go to a mountain called Sinai, Mount Sinai. They go there, Moses goes up on the mountain and God speaks to him. And that's basically from the beginning of the Bible right up to where we've got here now today. Missing out a few stories. So, check it out. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 2. It says, And God spoke all these words. So these are the words God spoke to Moses. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Let's break that down to the first bit. He says, I am the Lord your God. What God's doing here is he's stating the relationship. God knows that we get relationships with people wrong. He knows that we get the relationship wrong with him. So he's stating the relationship at the beginning and saying, look you lot, I am the Lord your God. He's letting them know the relationship. Now notice, right, he doesn't say, I am your sugar daddy. I don't know if you noticed that as you read it. Like He does not say, I am your sugar daddy. But sometimes we get the relationship with God wrong, right? And sometimes we think, God is this person who, whenever I need something, I'll go to him and say, give me something, and he will give it to me. And if he doesn't give it to me, then boy, I'm not going to church for a long time, because he owes me. It doesn't say he's our sugar daddy. He says, I am the Lord your God. He also doesn't say, I am your temporary God to pick up whenever you want. And if you think about it, that's very much how our culture is, yeah? Like for some people, their God is Beyonce. I see people people on Facebook saying, I worship Beyonce, right? But then a few months later, their God isn't Beyonce anymore. Who is it? Be like Rihanna. Now they worship Rihanna. Well, what happened to Beyonce? Well, she don't do it for me no more. And I read that thing about her. Not impressed. We're used to swapping out our gods, right? Like, when, when, when I was really young, when we were kids in Roehampton, some people kept changing their football team, yeah? <laughs> right? If Man U was top of the league, it wasn't called the Premiership back then, but if they were top of Division One, that's what it was called when I was a kid, then, then you'd have some kids who were like, yeah, I support Man U. And then when Liverpool were top back in the day, then you'd have people like, the same person would be like, You say, who do you support? Oh, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would keep going like that. Same way some people have their favourite footballers. Like, I know there's someone here who their favourite footballer will always be Van Persie. But some of you go through, like, oh, they're my favourite footballer right now. Another time, nah, they're my favourite footballer. We are used to changing our gods for what suits us. And don't we often do that with God as well? Sometimes I'm desperate for God and I'm asking him for help. And other times I feel like I don't really need him. I found a new God. I found something else that does it for me right now. And I feel like I don't, I don't need God. So God's getting the relationship right and he's saying, I am the Lord your God. I am your fixed God. I'm supposed to be your God all the time. Not like, remember in school when the teacher's in the classroom, we act all good. And when the teacher walks out, we act all naughty. And we never grow out of that, right? Because then when you get a job, when the boss is there on the shop floor, working really hard, we see the boss go out those doors and we're like, whew, I can relax now. We're used to being like, I will will follow this person when I have to, but I'll take a break as much as I possibly can. God's trying to get the relationship right with us and saying, no, I'm, I'm the Lord your God. I'm your fixed God. I'm supposed to be your Lord all the time. Now, let me tell you when I get this relationship wrong when I'm mad at my wife. I'm in a huff with my wife. And I'm thinking, hmm, hmm. And then in my mind, I realize, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. God forgave me of all my sins. Shouldn't I be forgiving my wife of whatever she's done or whatever I think she's done? And I'm like, no, later. When I do that, I'm basically saying, Lord, you're not going to be my Lord right now. Five, 10 minutes, maybe, but not right now. Let me be my own Lord right now. I'm getting the relationship wrong. And we all do this, right? We all get the relationship with with God wrong. Now, let's look at the next thing he says in verse 2. He says, Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery? So he's saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, Now, check it out. In ancient times, if you made a treaty with a king... Yeah, you know, like you've got two countries who are at war with one another and then they go to make peace. 
or maybe the king of one army beats the other army, then you make a treaty with that king. You say, let's have peace, and these are the terms of our peace. And what happens in ancient times is that the king would write out a contract. And in that contract, he would write out at the beginning the history of your relationship. He'd say how you got into relationship with one another, how you come to know one another. And that's exactly what God is doing here. He's writing up a contract with the Israelites. But in those days, they called it a covenant. And at the beginning, he's saying, this is the relationship. This is how we got into relationship with one another. And he says, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So what he's doing is he's saying, this is how the relationship started. I saved you. I saved you. That's how the relationship started. Can you see that the relationship God's people have with God is very different to other relationships we have with people? Like you th Think about how we normally view authority, like the police. Do you, it's not the case that the, you first heard of the police when the police saved you, right? For some of you, the first time you heard of the police was when they did something wrong, right? And we tend to not like that kind of authority. Wandsworth Council, it's not like you're thinking, oh, yes, I know about Wandsworth Council because they saved me. Maybe for some of us that is the case. But on the whole, we have a negative view of authority because of how we've come into relationship with them. But what about God? God is the authority, the Lord, who says, this is how we got to know one another. I saved you. I saved you. That is the amazing basis for a relationship. But notice, right, in this contract, in this contract, right, what happens is he says, I saved you. He says, I'm your Lord and I saved you. But a lot of us people who call ourselves Christians, we don't act like the relationship started with God saving us. In fact, a lot of us start, after a few years of being a Christian, we start acting like, yeah, man, I'm one of the good guys. I'm one of the good people. I'm pretty righteous. In fact, I know why God picked me, because I'm one of the good guys. That's why he picked me. Sometimes this happens very deep down in your subconscious. You don't even realize you're doing it until someone points out to you that you become a snob. And a lot of us can be snobs, where we start looking down on other people, being like, ooh, see the way that person behaves? <laughs> Not like me. I've never done anything like that in my whole life. That's terrible. And we start looking down on people. So let, let me tell you about Tracy. Tracy was a wonderful person. She'd become a Christian, and at first she was so humble. And everyone saw the change in her life. They're like, what's happened to you? And at first she would say, I don't know, I just think God saved me. Because there's nothing that I've done, it's just all God. He's amazing. And people really liked being around Tracy. Four years later, though, no one really wanted to be around Tracy. Because Tracy has started thinking, oh, I'm a really good person. I don't do this sin, I don't do that sin, not like that person over there. And when Tracy would meet other people, she would just start judging them and looking down on them. And no one wanted to be with Tracy now. And the reason why was because she got the relationship wrong with God because she stopped viewing God as her saviour. Instead, she started thinking like she was a good person who deserved to have God put her in his life instead of realizing she was an unworthy person who'd been saved. Maybe some of us today are becoming a bit snobbish and looking down on people because we're getting a relationship wrong with God that he's our savior. Now, if you look on the next bit, verse three, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. What, what is God saying now? You might have heard these before. What are they called? That's not the answer I'm looking for. Commandments. Give me more. The Ten Commandments, right? What God's doing now is he's now giving a list of the Ten Commandments. This is the way the contract works. God sets the relationship at the beginning. He says, I'm your Lord. Then he says, I'm your Savior. I save you from slavery. And then he says, now, here's the Ten Commandments. This is how I want you to live. So let me ask you this question. What did he do first? Did he save them or give them the commandments first? He saved them first, then he gave them commandments. Wow. A lot of us get that wrong, yeah? A lot of us think you've got to obey God's commandments first, and then he will save you. So I had a conversation with a friend of mine years ago out the front of church. 
I invited him into church and he said, D, I'm going to clean up my life first and then I'll come to church. And I said, I won't say his name, I said, I said, you don't have to do that because God saves you first and then he changes you. You don't have to clean yourself up. And my friend was like, do you hear yourself? Do you see how disrespectful that is to God? You're saying you can just come to God how you are. That is so disrespectful. And I was like, no, that's the way it works. Like you can never clean yourself up enough to see God. Never. And that's not the way it works. He saves us first and then he gives us his commandments, which means Christianity is open to anyone. It's open to absolutely anyone. We are the most inclusive club in the world. Anyone can come. Anyone is welcome because God saves you first and then he gives you his commandments. But sometimes we get this wrong. We get the relationship wrong with God. And sometimes us Christians make non-Christians think that they're not welcome, right? Because maybe we act in a snobby way to people. Oh, so you're still sleeping with your girlfriend. Hmm. And we're communicating to them, you've got to fix yourself up first and then God will save you. Whereas the truth is God saves you first. Or we see someone like, oh, you've got a lot of piercings on your face. Hmm. You've got a plan to get rid of those. And we make people feel you're not welcome until you clean up first. So we keep getting a relationship with God wrong and that makes an impact for non-Christians because then they think, oh, I can't come to Jesus. But they can. So... Let's look at these Ten Commandments, yeah? Exodus 20, verses 3 to 17. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, these are ten commandments. And you might be worried, thinking I'm going to break down every single one, that we're going to be here for time. But Jesus, years later, summed these Ten Commandments up into two commandments. So if you could turn there now, please. It's Matthew chapter 22. It's the last Bible passage we're going to look at today. It's Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. And what Jesus does is he gets these Ten Commandments and he breaks them down to make them real simple for us to get. And remember, these are the commandments that shows us how God wants us to live. He saves us first, and then he gives us these commandments. Matthew 22, verse 36. Someone came up to Jesus and they said this, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So right there, Jesus got 10 commandments and he like condensed them down to how many commandments? Two commandments. The first one is love God and the second one is love. Love your neighbor, love other people. So that's right there, you can boil down the Ten Commandments to love God and love other people, right? God saves us and he says, this is how I want you to live. Now, here's the thing. If God saves you, one of the ways you know you've been saved is you find you start wanting to love God and love other people more. 
I had a friend years ago, someone asked him, how do you know that you're a Christian? And he said, because I can get out of bed in the morning. And they were like, what do you mean? And he said, I could never get out of bed in the morning. He said, I was so lazy. All I cared about was myself. I woke up in the morning and all I could do was just lie there. That's all I wanted to do, lie there, not do anything. And he said, when I become a Christian, I found I wanted to get up in the morning because I wanted to serve God. I wanted to serve other people. So he knew God had done something in his life because now he found himself wanting to love God and wanting to love other people. And the way that works is that when God saves you, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit enables you to love God and love other people. You can't do it very well without the Holy Spirit. It's a bit like, has anyone here ever tried driving a car when it ain't got enough petrol in it? Yeah? It's, you, can, you can kind of get going, can't you? But it's not very successful. So I've done it. The top of Highcliffe Drive, anyone who knows Highcliffe Drive, top of the green, right? You can, you can take the handbrake off, yeah? And you can roll that car down and you can try to kind of start it along the way. And then as long as there's no cars coming along Danbury Avenue, at the end you can quickly turn left and you can still go on Danbury Avenue for a little bit and then it kind of gets slower and slower and slower and then it stops. That is kind of what it's like trying to obey God's commandments without his Holy Spirit. You can do it to a point. You can do so much. But you're always going to end up stopping and being like, nah, I try to love God, but... That's too far. I can't go that far. I try to love other people, but I can't go that far. That's too far. You need the petrol in the tank to be able to operate properly. Same way you need God's Holy Spirit to be able to obey his commandments, to be able to love him and love other people. So God gives us his Holy Spirit to obey his commandments. It's like he puts petrol in our tank and now we're suddenly like, rah, I feel like I love God right now. I actually want to go to church. I actually want to read the Bible. What's happening to me? I actually want to help people. That, that annoying neighbor is always rude to me. I was actually polite to them today. What's going on? What well, it is, the Holy Spirit's doing a work in your heart. But here's where we get the relationship wrong. When we start thinking, ooh, I'm doing so well right now. I've just done all these good things right now. I'm doing pretty good. The last time you or I got this relationship wrong, was where we did something good and later we felt really pleased with ourselves and maybe even thought, I wonder if everyone in the church saw me do that. I wonder if they know how patient I was just then. I wonder if they know how skillfully and how loving kindly I helped that person. I wonder if they saw it. Or if we've ever felt like, hmm, don't feel like I get any credit from people at church. No one seems to notice how gifted I am. When we act this way, we're getting a relationship wrong and forgetting that God gives us his Holy Spirit. Anything good we've done is because of him. It would be like, we've just had the Oscars, right? Now imagine if at the Oscar, you watched the awards at the Oscars and you saw an actor get up and the actor got up and said, thank you, I'd just like to say I did this all on my own. Even as a baby, I fed myself and I clothed myself. I, I taught myself to walk. I taught myself to talk, I taught myself to act, I created all my own acting opportunities, and this film only happened because of me, and the film's only good because of me, so please keep applauding, because you should. If, if you saw someone like that, you'd be like, rah, you got the relationship wrong, you got the relationship wrong with your mum, because your mum fed you, yeah, and clothed you, and taught you to walk and talk, and if, even if she didn't, someone else did, You got the relationship wrong with all your teachers in school who helped you, with the drama school that helped you, with your publicist, your agent, with the script writer, with all the fans. You've got the relationship wrong. But I know that me and a lot of us here get the relationship wrong with God in the same way where we feel like, oh yeah, I'm a good person. I've done that. Instead of realizing his Holy Spirit enabled me to do it like petrol in a car. Okay. So these, back to these Ten Commandments, right? What does God do first before he gives the Ten Commandments? He saves us and then he gives his commandments and he's saying, this is how I want you to live. Now that I saved you, I want you to love God and love other people. Let's look at some ways we get this relationship wrong and then we're we're finished. 
Okay, one way is that we ignore the commandments. We ignore the commandments in a relationship. So Peter, right? Peter says he's a Christian, okay? He's got two girlfriends going on at the moment, maybe three girlfriends, yeah? He's always drunk and he's always gossiping about people behind their back, right? And whenever a Christian comes up to him and says, bruv, what's going on? He always says, oh, don't be so judgmental. I'm a Christian. I'm forgiven the same way you're forgiven. What Peter's doing there is he's, he's getting the relationship wrong with God where he is ig ignoring the commandments God has given him. He's getting the relationship wrong. He's viewing Jesus as his saviour, but not as his Lord. Now, we can all do this. For some of us, our sins might be more subtle than Peter's. Right? We might not have three girlfriends going on. Right? But we might have all kinds of dodgy thoughts going on in our head throughout the day. Okay? And we sometimes forget, God wants me to live a different way now that he saved me. We might find we're not growing as a Christian the way we should, because we're forgetting God wants me to live a different way now. So that's one way we get the relationship wrong, where we forget his commandments. Another way is when we forget his salvation. We get the relationship wrong where we forget his salvation. So Tracy is a Christian who tries really hard to obey God's commands. And she also keeps watching other people around her and noticing when they don't obey God's commands. And as soon as they don't, she goes up to them and says, that's wrong what you did. I need to talk to you. Okay, what she's doing there is getting a relationship wrong. She's forgetting that God saved her. God saved her and then changed her. And she's forgetting that that's how God is with other people as well. She's getting the relationship wrong and instead thinking, yes, I'm a good person, I obey all his commands, I've got to make sure everyone else does as well. I'm not saying she's not a Christian, I'm saying she's getting the relationship wrong. Here's another way we get the relationship wrong, when we add extra commandments. So how many commandments did God give? Ten. He gave ten commandments and Jesus boiled them down to... Two, love God, love other people. Sometimes we add in an extra commandment, yeah? So let me tell you about Trevor, right? Trevor used to drink a lot. He'd become a Christian and he thought, you know what? I don't think I should drink at all now because it just seems unwise for me because when I drink, I stop loving God and I stop loving other people. I'm not going to drink nothing now. Wise choice for Trevor. But now what Trevor does is he starts going around everyone else at church, starts telling him, you mustn't drink, you mustn't drink, you mustn't drink, you mustn't drink. And what he's doing now is he's adding an extra commandment into the relationship with God. He's adding an 11th commandment, thou shalt not drink. God never said thou shalt not drink. God did say don't steal. So if when you get drunk you always end up stealing, then I'd say, yeah, don't drink then, right? If you're not loving to God and loving to other people when you drink, then yeah, don't drink. But this guy's just going around like it's a set commandment. You can't touch alcohol. You can't even put any wine when you're cooking up a meal, you know, in the recipe. And he's putting in an extra commandment. And he's getting the relationship wrong. And he's making demands on other people that God doesn't make himself. He's making it harder for other people to be Christians. That's another way we get the relationship wrong. Now, which makes us think, are there any extra commandments we add in and give to other people. Now, here's the last way we get the relationship wrong. And this is the hardest one to identify in your life. We add in extra commandments that we don't even know we've added in. We added them in when we were very young or years ago. And they're so normal to us, we don't even know we added them in. So Sandra was abused as a child. And deep down in her heart, she swore I will never let anyone else ever hurt me again. She swore that to herself. No one is ever hurting me ever again. And then years later, God saved her. And she was like, this is amazing. And for a couple of years, she had a Ready Breck glow around her. If you remember the Ready Breck adverts. And she's like, wow, this is amazing. But as the years go by, she finds her relationship with people is not working out very good. And she's like, I don't understand. Why does a relationship with people keep going wrong? What's going on? Part of what's been going on is she added an extra commandment into the relationship with God and other people, which is, thou shalt not ever let anyone ever hurt you again. 
And that means the way she's been with people, she's always making sure no one can ever hurt her. And it's also meant no one could ever love her. She snuck in an extra commandment, but she doesn't even know that she's done it. Or you got Pete. When Pete was a kid, he always heard the older boys saying, don't respect anyone unless they respect you. And he was like, that sounds good. I like that. Yeah. And, and what Pete did was from an early age, he decided respect was the most important thing. That was his currency. He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have the latest clothes or trainers, but he was like, I'll get respect. And then when he became a Christian, he brought that commandment into his relationship with God and other people, as if the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt respect Pete. And what he finds now is that he's always getting annoyed at people and angry at people because they're not respecting him properly. And he reacts in such a strong way that people don't want to respect him. And then he gets more angry because they're not respecting him. What's gone wrong here? He got the relationship with God wrong. He's treated the relationship as if God saved him and then gave 11 commandments. And the 11th one was, thou shalt respect Pete. And that's messing up his relationship with other people and his relationship with God. Right, last one. Last one, right? <laughs> I had a name. I had a name. But I've just, I've just realized there's someone here with that name, so I'm not going to use it. Someone give me a name to use. Madonna. Madonna? No, Donna. Donna, okay, Donna, yeah. Okay, so Donna, right? Donna grew up quite poor. And as a kid, she was like, I'm going to have money when I'm older. She dreamed of having money when she was older. She dreamed of living far away from Roehampton in a nice big house. Dreamed of having money. Then years later, she became a Christian. She snuck in an extra commandment. Thou shalt be rich. And the thing is, she loves Jesus. She loves other people. But whenever there's a decision to be made between serving the church or making money, guess which one she picks? Making money, because deep in her heart, there's always been this extra commandment of, thou shalt be rich. And it ends up messing up her relationship with God, because she ends up putting God second to money. And it messes up her relationship with other people. They don't get to know her so well. They don't get served by her, because she's serving money. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. Now, by the way, I'm not saying we shouldn't uh, protect ourselves from being hurt by people. I'm not saying we, should, that we shouldn't ever have money. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have respect from people. What I'm saying is sometimes we make these into commandments, where we live our whole life and our relationship with God and other people based on these commandments. And that's getting the relationship wrong. So let's, let's sum this up. How are we going to get a relationship with God right? I've got good news and bad news, right? Bad news is we're always going to be getting it wrong. Because if you read the Bible, starting in Genesis and going right the way through, you just see all these people, godly people who knew God, who got to actually hear his voice and talk to him, they keep getting the relationship wrong. Even Adam and Eve, can you believe it? They got the relationship wrong. They didn't treat him as Lord when they said, yeah, let's eat the fruit. And then they didn't treat him as Savior. That they, they tried to cover their own nakedness hiding in the bushes, putting fig leaves on them, instead of letting go into God and saying, save me. They tried to fix themselves up first. You see it with loads of other Bible characters, that they get the relationship with God wrong. So the solution is not, right, I'm just going to be really hench and I'm going to get the relationship right. You can't do it. No, no human has been able to do it until 2,000 years ago when Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. He was God and he came down, became a human. So he was fully God, but fully human. And he came and lived the relationship outright. As the son of God, he treated God as his Lord, as his father. You keep hearing him refer to his father in this way where he totally obeyed his father the whole time. And he totally trusted his father the whole time. What he was doing was he was living out the two commandments or the Ten Commandments. He was living them out in our place, in the place of anyone who would follow him as their saviour. It's a bit like if you had to run in the 100 metres Olympics, okay, 
And let's say you know you can run 100 meters in 12 seconds. Okay? Now, at my age, if I could run 100 meters in 12 seconds, I'd be quite happy. But is that good enough to win at the Olympics? Does anyone know what the record is at the moment for 100 meters? 9.58, right, so there's a man who knows his sports. So 9.58, right? So you can't win. You can't win, right? But then Usain Bolt comes along, he steps down on the tracks, right? And he says, I'm going to run it for you. And the announcer says in different languages, Usain Bolt is going to be running in this person's place. And at the end, Usain Bolt wins the race. He gets 9.56, breaks his record. And then, instead of Bolt doing his, Bolt grabs you and he says to everyone, look at this guy, and then puts you up on the podium and you get the gold medal and everything. Yeah, that's kind of like what Jesus does for his people. He says, I will live out the Ten Commandments in your place. I'll do it all for you. And then at the end, you get credit for it. At the end, it's as if you obeyed all these commandments. Now, for me, that's, that's amazing. That is amazing. But it goes even deeper than that, because he also took our punishment. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment for people like me. So it's a bit like back in the day in Britain, we had hangings, right? And imagine you've committed crimes and you've been found guilty and they said, we're going to hang you. And they have the noose there and they take you up to the block and they're about to put you on the block and hang the noose around your neck. And then a man comes along and says, no, I've got this. You stay back. And he steps up on the block, puts the noose around his head and lets himself be hung in your place instead. That's what Jesus does for anyone who will receive him. He takes the punishment for every time we've disobeyed God's commandments, every time we haven't obeyed God, every time we haven't loved other people, Jesus takes the punishment in our place. With such a wonderful saviour, I reckon it's worth trying to get the relationship right with Jesus. And so I'll end with this. How can we get the relationship with Jesus right? I have a thing that I call the Lord and Saviour prayer. The Lord and Saviour prayer, which is where you start off praying, Lord, and you just start praying to God about him being your Lord. So it could go something like, oh Lord, you've commanded me to love you and love other people, but I keep not doing that. Please forgive me. Something like that. It could be, Lord, I know you saved me to live a certain way and I'm not living that way. Please forgive me. And then there's the saviour prayer. So you've done the Lord prayer, now you do the saviour prayer, and now you, you just pray stuff about him being your saviour, stuff like, oh, Jesus, save me from all my sin, all the times I haven't obeyed your commandments. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved me first. It can involve saying things to God like, thank you that you've saved me and given your Holy Spirit so that I can start obeying your commandments now. This is the Lord and Saviour prayer. Now, in the business world, a lot of people like to start their day. Does anyone know what it's called, what they do? Centering. A lot of people like to start their day centering themselves. You see, a lot of some of the world's richest people, early in the morning, they're centering. They're not checking their email or nothing. They're centering themselves. I'd like to suggest a way we can do this is center ourselves on God being Lord and Saviour. You might want to try it each morning for the rest of the week. Or you might want to try it once a week. Just in the morning, centering yourself on God being Lord and Saviour and taking time to just pray, Lord, pray stuff about him being Lord, and then Saviour, pray stuff about him being Saviour. Why don't we finish now with me praying the Lord and Saviour prayer, and you can all say amen at the end. Lord, you are our Lord and we just keep disobeying you, ignoring you, disrespecting you. We are sorry for our sin and we ask that you forgive us. We recognize that you want us to live a certain way and we keep doing wrong and not living that way. Forgive us, Lord God. Lord, you are also our saviour and we thank you, Jesus, that you are our saviour, that you hung on the cross that you died and took all the punishment for our sin if we will believe in you. 
And we say, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for saving us, for taking the penalty of our sin. And thank you also, Jesus, for living out all those commandments in our place so that we get the credit for it. And thank you, Jesus, that you give us your Holy Spirit so that we can live out your commandments. And I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to obey your commandments, to love you and to love other people. And when we fall short, help us to quickly repent and turn to you and ask for forgiveness and to do the right thing. In Jesus' name, amen.